Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Peace and blessings and God's heavenly light and power and mercy and forgiveness and guidance and grace be with you all. This is Ihsan. I'm joined by my good friend and brother John Abdul Samad for another discussion. We're trying to do these somewhat consistently, uh, at least uh, you know once a month, I think, at the moment, and we'll see how it goes from there. And we wanted to address the topic, something that comes up quite a bit. So anyway, first of all, welcome to everybody. Welcome to you, John Abdul Samad. Welcome to you. Thank you. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. <laughs> nice to, to be here again. Like uh, I like doing those. I think it's very uh, interesting. Yeah, me too. Let's let's see how this continues to develop and evolve because you know there's this idea of emergence, and basically it states that when different elements come together, a new property emerges. So you'll notice, right, in your own personal lives, who you're with ends up giving rise to different types of conversations. And sometimes you may be surprised at the level of conversation you have with certain individuals, and then also the lack of, let's say, uh, a very developed level of conversation you have with other people because of the state that everybody's in. So there's an emergent property or an emergent state that comes out of different combinations of even human beings. You can see this in all of your relationships. So I enjoy these conversations myself as well. Hopefully you do, John, and hopefully you guys listening and watching do as well. And so today, a topic that comes up, has come up quite a bit, is on prayer, on salah. I think that this would be a good topic to address. You know, there, there's many angles to this, many aspects of this that comes up quite often. And one is, of course, how to improve our quality of our prayers, how to pray effectively, because this is the, you know, fundamental practice of a Muslim, of a believer, is the prayer, the salah. And so, how can we do it well? This is a question that comes up. How can we develop presence or khushu in our salah? And I also think that the way that we'll discuss this is the power, the efficacy, the benefit of a meditative or mindful practice in terms of augmenting the quality of our prayers. You know, if a Muslim's prayer is good, everything is good. The religion is good. The connection with Allah is good. But when the prayer is weak and lacking, everything falls apart. The Prophet of Allah said, this is the first thing we will be asked about on the Day of Judgment is the prayer. So it's that important. The prayer is fundamental in Islam. It's the defining uh, spiritual practice and exercise for a believer. And so I think it would be really valuable for us to discuss the prayer and also how we can improve the quality of our prayer through practice. John, do you want to add anything to that intro? Yes. No, I think it's, uh, I think it's perfect. That's exactly uh, what I think is uh, the right angle to, because I think that the, the prayer, Salah, is actually the, the whole the whole path, the whole spiritual path that you, my perception of the Salah is like a concentration of everything is there. Everything you do outside of Salah is a preparation for a proper Salah. So all the reading, the studying, the purification, the, 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 the even charity, everything is to prepare your heart, your mind, and your body for the proper Salah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's what I think. That's why I think it's a great subject. We need to, 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 to dig in. Yeah, to go deeper. <laughs> That's very well said. That everything is a prayer, preparation for salah. Everything is a preparation for prayer. For this conversation, we'll be using those terms interchangeably. Sometimes in English, prayer can also mean like a supplication, which we would say du'a. But in this conversation, prayer salah, we're talking about salah when we say prayer. I really like how you said that, John, how everything is a preparation for prayer, because what is prayer? You know, if we're if we're praying properly and if we understand it properly, prayer is standing before God. It is standing in the presence of Allah and actually communicating and conversing with Allah. First, we begin by praising Allah, right? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, rahman rahim, and so on. We're praising Allah, we're acknowledging Allah. We're establishing in our own hearts and minds His Lordship, and then the prayer begins to transform into a direct conversation with Allah, asking for guidance. And so on. So everything is really preparing us for this moment in which we're going to stand in the presence of Allah. 
And if we do that properly, I mean, the Prophet ﷺ said that the prayer of the believer is their miraj, it's their ascension into the Divine Presence. So if we do it properly, our prayer becomes an ascension. If we don't, yes, we're meeting the obligations, minimum obligation, but we're missing an essential component, an aspect and benefit of the prayer. I remember reading a story of one of the great awliya who was standing for prayer, and I believe this was Abu Yazd al-Bistami as well, the Salah of Surah, I'll have to check to be 100% sure, but I believe it was him. And he was going to lead the prayer, and there were people praying behind him. And every time he would raise his hands to say, Allahu Akbar, to begin the prayer, uh, he, would be able, he wouldn't be able to do it. And he kept doing it, uh, trying again and again. And this went on for quite some time until finally he was able to say, Allahu Akbar, and, and begin the prayer. And when later he was asked about it, he said he was in awe of Allah's majesty and presence. Now that is the prayer of a believer. That is the prayer of one who is in the presence of Allah. Very different from the absent-minded, sort of robotic, mechanical prayer that we're tending to do typically, right? What we normally find ourselves just doing to meet the obligation and to meet the requirement. But this great servant of Allah, this great wali of Allah, he was in such awe of Allah that he was having difficulty even taking the name of God because he felt the power and the presence of just Allah's name. Yeah. So I wanted to jump in here with you, John, because you come kind of from a background in which, of course, there was no prayer to God. You come from a, more of a Buddhist uh, upbringing, training, in a lot of history in that tradition. And there really isn't prayer to, to God, to the divine. So having come into Islam, what are your thoughts? And I'm curious to hear about what's been an opening for you with regards to prayer, having come from a tradition that doesn't really emphasize this type of worship. There's a lot of meditative practice, which is we'll talk about as being extremely beneficial, but there isn't this relationship with the divine, with the creator, with a God, the God. So what's that been like for you? And maybe if you can just, you know, talk a bit about that. This, uh, this need uh, that we all have inside of us, this uh, God-shaped hole, uh, you know, inside of our hearts, uh, uh, mine, uh, uh, mine was, <laughs> was you know, uh, in need of being, you know, uh, uh, filled by, by God. And I could feel, I could feel, that I needed this uh, connection, uh, this uh, with with a God, because the difference, okay, in, in Buddhism, it's not that God is not in Buddhism. It's just that they don't know it's there. <laughs> that, that that's my belief today. I, I won't go into details about that. That's not important. But it's true that in Buddhism, you're supposed to 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 uh, they will describe uh, some uh, state of minds. That you know, uh, vastness, uh, uh, ocean of energy, compassion, love. They would describe some a lot of uh, of um, uh, attributes of God that they experience in in those states, and uh, but they even sometimes will talk about a certain uh, presence. But in that case, it's going to be the guru. It has to be the guru that you feel the presence of, because it's uh, it, it's never going to be. Uh, yeah, like like what we have in in uh, monotheistic religion, and that was missing for me, uh, because I think because it was I think because it's already there when we we're born, and mine became like <laughs> my relationship with God became like a, a you know a unused at some point and atrophied like a muscle you know uh, 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 that shrinks. And uh, but I reactivated it because you know now I, I still I reconnected you know with uh, this conversation. It's like a conversation with God that I've lost when I was a Buddhist, and that I was trying to reconnect to because this is the I think the easiest and the fastest way to to uh, to to reach anywhere spiritually uh, because you're not. Uh, you're acknowledging your, your, that you're power. <laughs> you, you, you have no power, that you're power, powerless in front of, a, of this, you know, uh, of the creator. This, this is the quickest way to, 
to uh, to let go of your ego if you want to talk uh, new age talk you know <laughs> it's much faster than that submission is so real anyway you know uh, it's so much faster than than um, I don't know trying to to understand the mechanism of your ego and to control it to become you know stronger through endless efforts personal efforts now in in uh, in Islam and maybe in other monotheistic religion I don't know but in Islam it's perfect because it's so much it's so simplified the the movement of the mind is clear from the beginning what you have to do this this surrender uh, I think it's it's easy to let go when you know that you're letting go into the, the arms of God. You know, you're letting go into this ocean of love, of benef beneficent, you know, intentions, and and when you feel it, it's easy to let go of everything and to surrender and to give your life because you're like a child in the arms of your mother. You know, you you completely trust your mother. You have no choice. But when you're on your own on the spiritual path and there's not this component of God, even though you, you will receive blessings, even though what you're doing, as a Buddhist, you, you're trying to be a good human being. You're practicing generosity, love, compassion, thinking of putting others before you, yourself. You're practicing humility. You're, you're doing everything. So you're receiving a lot of benefits from that. But I think this surrender, maybe they can do it, but I, I wasn't able to do it without <laughs> this feeling, this benef you know, loving presence of God. And you can, I, I, you can imagine that you're receiving this love from your guru, your, your lama, or I don't know. But to me, it, it, I was, it wasn't working. I, was, I felt like I was imagining something. It was psychological. It wasn't in the heart because it, because it wasn't true. It was imagined in my head. I was imagining some blessings. I was even even using visualizations. And visualizations can be useful, but when it's happening for real, you don't need them. I don't need to visualize my blood circulation, you know, my, my blood vessels, and I don't need to visualize my heart pumping. It's happening. If I pay attention, I will notice, I will feel. So so it's the same, I think. A lot of a waste of time because we already have in our hearts, all of us as human beings, I think we already have uh, this, you know, uh, capacity of connecting with the presence of God. We have it as, I had it as a child. I was talking to God 24, maybe not 24 seven, but I was a lonely child and my imaginary friend was God because my grandmother told me, you can talk to God all the time. That was my only practice. But as a teenager, you know, I learned that it was not cool to do that and that it was maybe stupid and, and I disconnected. I lost it. But we all have it. And if you convert to Islam from another religion or from atheism, you will realize that you already have this inside of you. This uh, You have the plug <laughs> to connect with God. But it's unused. And yeah, why are we not using it? So that's a long answer. I hope you will do some editing there, but that's what I was trying to, <laughs> to say that when I came back to, I was about to say when I came back to Islam. Yeah, that's basically it. Because I was practicing Islam as a child. I was practicing Islam. All child are born Muslim. Now I know. All children are born Muslim. Now I know. Because what I was looking for is exactly what I'm, you know, I'm learning with you. <laughs> what I'm learning to do now, I'm learning to go back to my natural relationship with God that I had as a child. Yeah. And Salah, I think, even has some elements in there, some secret elements <laughs> we can talk later about. As you were speaking, I, it kept coming up for me, this idea that that approach is, you know, one approach can be very cerebral very conceptual, very analytical, very mind-based. And I'm thinking the difference being the way of the heart. You talked about being able to surrender into the loving ocean of energy, either of one's guru, right? But that's so limited. It still seems like it is so limited. Like, where is the end of the guru, if not the divine? If the guru isn't connected to 
distinctly and clearly connected to the creator. I mean, okay, he may be an enlightened being, but for me, it seems like there's something so profound and so essential that it's still not there to make it easy to jump and to dive into surrender. Because what does surrender ultimately take? What is opening and giving oneself up? It really is death. And, and willfully giving oneself to this, diving into this ocean of death and non-existence, it really requires love in order to truly be done. I believe it requires love. And of course, this is why, again, Allah Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it so possible. And, and what I've seen amongst those who are highly developed, if we want to use that language, in Islam, like the awliya of Allah, these, these mighty friends of Allah, I've never seen anything that even remotely resembles them anywhere else on the planet. Their level of development, their level of annihilation, their level of complete extinction in the ocean of love is unparalleled. And you can see it in their eyes. So I remember one time, one of my early experiences was when I met, I used to attend dhikr, uh, very, you know, when I first was exploring uh, or coming into contact with the sawwaf, I was together in these dhikr circles. And after I joined uh, the school or the teachings or the brotherhood of my master, uh, there was one gentleman, he was very quiet and calm. I may have said, mentioned the story to you at some point, but he would always sit peacefully, calmly, always smiling, this gentle old man, Dr. Ahmed Hearns, beautiful, beautiful fellow. And uh, I remember somebody once telling me he was a Zen master. He used to be a Zen master running a monastery in Japan for like, I don't know, maybe 20 years or something. He used to run a Zen monastery in Japan. So he's a very highly sort of ranked, uh, I guess, teacher and authority. And yet here he was in the thicker circle, having embraced Islam, having come to the company of our sheikh. And I remember in just, you know, just wondering, wow, what was it that brought him to Islam from there as a master? It's one thing if you're just a regular person, but here you are running a school. And I asked him, and this was his answer. He said he felt that this way had heart. That's how he described it to me at the time, that this way had heart. And it took me a while to understand what he meant by that, what that meant, but it has a lot to do with what we're discussing now, the way of love, the way of love, the way of connection with the Creator. You know, subhanAllah. So you've done a lot of meditative practice right, in your Buddhist training. In, in all those years, you entertained extensive meditative practice and so maybe one of the questions that i'd like to dive into now is how do you find and maybe i'll share some as well from my perspective how do you find that training in that type of a background to be of benefit to you in your salah now as a muslim i've learned to uh to be present uh and that's basically the most important thing I think I've learned in meditation, actually in my life, I think. I learned to how to be present. I learned to notice when I'm not present and come back to being present. I learned how, how to do it. And because of that, uh, I know how to be, uh, like, uh, how to, to also observe my, my, um, what's going on inside of me. So when I approach Salah, I pay attention to what's going on inside of me. And I notice that, uh, that there's a lot <laughs> in Salah that can be, you know, missed if you're not aware, if you're not uh, used to, or if you haven't developed, I would say, even developed the sensitivity. I'm not sure that anybody can do it, could do it quickly, you know, even if doing, if practicing, uh, properly i don't think you can you have to develop the sensitivity by effort and it takes time but this inner sensitivity uh i think it's very useful because the, the salah you you if you do it properly uh you don't want to be distracted <laughs> you if you do it with uh, presence it is so enjoyable that 
you don't feel like there's no effort there. <laughs> effort should be before, before you, you're in front of your, of your, your mat, your prayer mat, you know, uh, maybe during wudu if you want, or before even. But when you're there and you're present, you realize that, um, yeah, no, you want to do it. And, and actually, actually, you, you, I'm proven, proven every time after Salah, that the fruit of Salah is not my effort, from my effort, <laughs> because the peace that I feel after praying the Salah is not proportional with the effort that I put into uh, gathering myself to be present. That's uh, something very different from meditation. Meditation, you, 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 uh, you reap what you, what you sow, you know, what you, you sow, you, what you put into it, you, you, you can, you know, uh, profit, but uh, this is different. You just have to be present, and it's going to happen if you're present. But it's going to happen not on your own term. You know, it's going to. But I feel that there's a peace there, uh, amazing peace uh, that I that comes, and it comes. It's prescribed, you know, like five times a day. So it's amazing. <laughs> so it's a uh, um, because meditation can give you peace also. You can prescribe meditation five times a day, but nobody will do it unless you're in a monastery and you, you're, you're, you know, you're under surveillance. And even there, they try to skip sometimes, you know, to stay in bed and not meditate. But the salad is different. You have no choice but to do it. <laughs> you have no choice. So this is amazing. This is an amazing uh, help, I think, to, to, uh, to have these five, uh, time, you know, that you really, really come back to your center and, you know, um, recollect yourself, remember yourself, and uh, to give yourself. You have to, you know, own yourself at least first, and then you, you give yourself to, to God. And this is, I mean, this is perfect. Those movements have been, I think, have been uh, designed to, to help the the surrender you know different i learned in meditation you were asking me my years of meditation but i also also practiced qigong and tai chi and uh, tai chi and you you really at some point you become very aware that your posture influences your state of mind and and the opposite is is also true uh but and you know that certain posture will favor you know uh will uh more like favor some types of emotions or even of energies inside of you. And you become very sensitive to that. But the movement of the Salah is a therapy in itself. To, because if you change your energetic body, you, it will change your, your thoughts also. You know, if you change your thoughts, you will change your, your pattern, energetic pattern. But you, you can go the other way too. If you really put your energetic body in a state of peace, even without its will, you will be in a state of, of peace, you know. Your mind won't be able to be as excited or as distracted as it was before because the movement itself, like, uh, really puts you inside, puts you, it centers you, the, the, the moves themselves, you know, very much. But, you know, I practiced some movements that were designed, maybe, not, I wouldn't say invented. I don't think humans can truly invent anything. Maybe discovered, maybe by accident, maybe inspired, but the sala is movement revealed, <laughs> you know. It's not discovered. So by discovered movement, we kind of came to understand, you know, what was good for the body and the mind and the heart. But by revealed movements, that's the revealed Qigong. That's the, the one we all need, you know. Uh, it's not surprising that you can reach, you know, it's so much more efficient, you know. Uh, but yeah, I would say that without maybe my meditation experience, I wouldn't have been able to pay attention enough or gather my, my mind enough to, to notice what was going on when I ener energetically, when I pray Salah. And this is... This is uh, yeah, it's pleasurable. <laughs> you you want to do it, even physically. It feels good to do. Yeah. 
Uh, absolutely, physically, especially you if you've been, you know, I remember when we were taking the Hijra walk from Mecca to Medina, and the, just the exhaustion, the tiredness, the strain of being out all day physically active, and then you enter into Salah, well, it was like a divine rest. The postures felt so good. And I absolutely agree with you that that it's it's a it's a metaphysical truth that our postures affect our state, their expressions of state, and vice versa. So if your state is not good internally, you'll probably have a hunched posture and not a very good posture, and you'll be frowning and all of that. It's a physical manifestation of the internal state. But if you actually just correct your posture, you straighten up your back, you smile, that immediately affects your internal state as well. So these postures are very powerful. Being in ruku or, or bowing, being in prostration or sajda, these are powerful prostrations or powerful postures to effect change on our soul. It, it creates internal, it, these, these are internal postures as well as just physical postures. You know, I've seen number of times doctors recommend these exact postures to people for therapeutic benefits for anxiety and for uh, circulation and for heart rhythm. I've seen doctors literally tell people, go into this posture and he bends over. And then I've seen it on the internet, even a doctor prescribing even uh, being in this child's pose, basically, right? In a state, in a prostrated position as a, a way to release tension from the body. You know, it's quite incredible. The other thing I wanted to mention is about how meditative practice can, again, as you described, augment the quality of salah. So I, on my own, began meditating, you know, even in high school, I just picked up a book from the library and started learning how to meditate. So I had a bit of that background, and I was always interested and intrigued by it. And when I, of course, began to go a little bit deeper into Islamic spirituality, I could see that meditation was a big component of it. So I was meditating very early on. And in my experience, what meditative practice does, you described it as it develops your capacity or your potential for presence. What meditation does, what meditative practice does, whether it's sitting meditation, whether it's moving meditation like Qigong or Tai Chi, or even a yoga practice, what these do is they cultivate your capacity for presence. This means your ability to be open and here and now, connected to this, the moment, this ocean of energy and life and light that we are subsistent in. So what meditation does is it begins to create this greater capacity to experience presence. And it's almost like this fine-tuning of the heart where you can increasingly experience the power of divine presence in any given moment. And sometimes this manifests quite strongly. So maybe you've had experiences like this, but I have clearly had experiences where I'm talking with someone or I'm walking or hiking or just sitting and observing. And it's like this divine calm descends. And I'm, I'm aware of it. I'm witness to it. I'm experiencing it. Like this divine presence everywhere fills everything and you don't want to do anything. At that point, you don't want to talk. You don't want to, Move. I've been on hikes where I am walking and I feel this divine presence all around. And I have to just stop and just kneel. Like I had to literally take a knee. I had to I had to bend down and just sit and just sit there for a moment in awe. And I've had a friend ask me, What are you doing? And I'm and I and I would say, Can you not feel it? Like, do you not experience this moment? One time I remember I was running in the hills. This was actually very early on when I was still in college. I was running in the hills, and as soon as I got done running, and I was walking back through the fields to get to the parking lot, and I could just feel this immense moment of divine peace and presence and awe and wonder and joy and beauty, just all everywhere. I looked around, the sky was blue, the grass was green. It was just perfection everywhere you looked. And this utter awe came over me, and I found myself at that moment on the grass, just falling into prostration, just spontaneously falling into prostration. 
And so I say this because meditative practice helps to make possible increasingly that connection to divine presence, to khushu, to immersion. And then, of course, that's not just even in salah. That, that translates to the rest of your life as well. You could be in conversation with someone. And if you're with someone that's highly attuned, and I've experienced this as well with several people, practitioners, right, either Muslim and even some non-Muslim, but they're so attuned to themselves and they've developed the capacity for presence that we've been in conversation and at the same moment, it's like we both sensed, whoa, something's happening. It's like this divine peace is descending on creation. And we're having a conversation, even a heated conversation, because I remember one friend I used to test quite a bit, and they would test me in terms of ideas. And it was almost, I wouldn't say a debate or argument, but it was almost like testing ideas. So sometimes these conversations would get quite heated, and all of a sudden, it's like divine presence and divine peace descends. And it's like at the same time, we both just stopped and just like absorbed and just became still and that lasted for i don't know how long a few minutes maybe more and afterwards we, we were both like wow did you feel that and it was it was mutual so when you're with someone that's attuned that's that's practiced that's cultivated capacity it develops this ability to share even in this experience of presence and so i think that that's incredibly profound because when you can share that with other human beings it's connection to other human beings through connection with Allah. And I believe this is the deeper meaning of love someone for the sake of Allah, as the Prophet said, or as the Islamic principle goes, to love for the sake of God. You can actually love through Allah. And if you are with someone, could be your spouse, could be a friend, you know, if you're with someone, could be a teacher that has that capacity, has developed the capacity of her presence. And when that divine presence manifests or opens, and you can both feel it, now it's it's divine love that unites all of the hearts. And I've experienced this with, again, like I said, with some experienced uh, Muslims as well, and practitioners, and people have been on the path for some time, and whose hearts are open and connected. And that's quite profound. It's a profound experience to connect with other human beings will be able to share that experience with other human beings who have developed a capacity for presence. Let me hand it over to you, John. What are your thoughts? Yeah, oh, uh, I, uh, I've experienced that many times. And, uh, first of all, that piece you were, you were talking about in nature, actually. Yeah. I, I spent a lot of time in nature. I was a very solitary kid, kid for a, long periods of time and has spent a lot of time in nature and I basically yeah I, I used to call it I was hey I was a kid it's funny I used to say I'm becoming one with the tree or one with the rock or one I used to play like that I was focusing on something and try to connect and feel or a bird or a, and I could feel because I was crazy I could feel that there was this communion exchange that we were existing together, let's say. And when that peace comes, because the peace always comes when you're in that state of attunement, when you're attuned with the universe or nature, there's always the peace because that's the natural state. That's nature telling you, you see, that's what you need. That's where you need to go back. Come back. That's, that's, how you, that's what you've been looking for your whole life. But that state of peace, I know that when you learn how to touch it a little bit, create it, <laughs> not really, but inside of you, reach it a little bit, you can, I noticed that you can bring it and a kind of influence. Uh, I, I, I used to have like play with that. Can I calm the, the, the train, the, the, you know, the car, in the, the, the subway? There's a certain energy when I get in there. Sometimes so bad that I feel like I want, to, I want to get out because I'm very sensitive. But if I myself am able to meditate stronger, you know, really bring that peace, I can notice a difference in the energy, in the even noticeable. People are calmer, people friendlier. If it's a long ride, friendlier to each other. And I'm not saying that I'm doing anything. I'm not doing anything, actually. I'm just holding the space here. 
I'm, I'm staying here, not going everywhere, not reacting to the external. I'm, I'm trying to stop reacting to the external and remain peaceful. And when I can do that, it, as if I am through me, this, uh, this environment is being influenced, blessed. Uh, but I think it's because we need that. And unconsciously, that's what we're, these people are looking for. They're trying to, to calm down. That's why they're running crazy, because they're running after peace. You know? That's why they're so aggressive, because they, they, they're, they're desperate for that peace. So when you can hold a space, but it's hard. But I, I heard stories of masters who even calm the, the sea. You know? They were on a boat, on a raft, about to sink, but the master sat quietly and the ocean calmed itself, you know. So, no, because the ocean is not existing in separately, you know, outside there. We all related, inter, and that's what you are feeling in nature that connection that the child can have and not lose if he's very sensitive, like we were. <laughs> you, you know, you can go back to it and, and bring it back to humanity. Like, you know, like Prometheus stealing the fire from the gods <laughs> because they, I think they need it. That's what they need. Um, and uh, I totally agree. Totally agree. That peace, this is, some people never experience that. They don't even remember anything. Is that possible? I don't know. I tend to believe that we're all born, you know, in a state of grace, but apparently some people uh, don't seem to remember any of that. If they were to listen to me, they would think I'm, I'm talking nonsense. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> Not only Prometheus uh, stealing fire from the gods and bringing it back to humanity, but uh, we can look at our own history of the prophets, Moses going to the mountain, literally uh, connecting with the fire and the light of God, bringing that back to humanity. The prophet Muhammad وسلم, uh, going to the cave, to the mountain, and then bringing light and revelation back to humanity. And so that's uh, this idea, right? Communion. It really is this cultivation of a, an experience or a connectedness with what is, with all that is, but not so much the objects and forms of things. This gives you a great capacity for empathy and for connection to all things, all living things. It gives you a, a great ability to connect with all living things. That's for sure. But there's something even deeper because what's happening through presence practice, through meditative practice, and this is really what Salah is supposed to be, but through presence practice, what begins to happen is this connectedness with literally the substrate of reality itself, the ocean of oneness that everything exists within. And that's what connects everything and everyone together. So when a master is connected to that divine state and presence, and then the ocean is turbulent. What's happening is peace is being channeled through them and calming even the ocean. Peace becomes channeled even through you as you're sitting in the subway station. Right? It's nothing to do with us. All we're actually doing is just becoming present so that the, the will of the divine, the power and the light and the energy of the divine flows through the servant into creation. And this is one of the more subtle meanings of what it means to be a Khalifa, a vicegerent of Allah, a deputy of Allah, to be a conduit, to be a living conduit, to be a vessel for Allah's will in light to enter into creation. So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? You're the best of nations raised for mankind. You, were, you enjoin good and you prevent evil. It's so deep, just this one verse. The more we think about it, there's oceans and oceans of meaning in it. You enjoin good and you prevent evil. Well, who can enjoin good and prevent evil? Allah. We have no power. There's nothing that we can do. In fact, most of the evil is from us as human beings. But Allah is saying, you are the best of nations. You enjoin good and you prevent evil. That is a direct statement to those whom he has established as deputies, vicegerents, khalifas, Khulafa of Allah Almighty or Rahman. And so it's they who have cultivated the capacity to get out of the way, to surrender themselves fully, to be true servants of Allah, so that it is Allah's will that then acts through them. 
And this is, of course, the Hadith Qudsi, narrated in most of the canonical books of a Hadith, that a servant will approach me with what I have required of them and continues to approach me with optional practice, in presence practice, dhikr, meditation. This is, of course, nawafil. Continues to approach me until I love them, and then I become the seeing with which they see, the hearing with which they hear, the tongue with which they speak, the, the hand with which they act, and the foot with which they walk. And if they were to ask me anything, I grant it to them, and so on. But look what Allah is saying. It's basically a testament to this state in which the servant becomes empty of themselves. And then it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who fills them, his power, his presence, his spirit that fills the servant and acts through the servant. That is what it means to be a servant of Allah, a true abd of Allah, is to be selfless, to be willless, to be a vessel and a conduit for divine will. So, you know, the story, for example, in history of the great mystic Halaj, Mansur al-Halaj, who was killed, who was killed because he said, An al -haq. he said, I am the truth. Haq is, of course, one of the names of God. So, of course, he was accused of blasphemy and of kufr. And so they he was put to death for blasphemy. It's a direct, he was a manifestation of this state itself in which Allah is saying, I become the tongue with which he speaks. Halaj was gone through his absolute submission, service, surrender, and love, annihilation in the oceans of love of Allah Almighty. There was no halaj left. It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what people don't understand. If we say this, it's kufr. But it wasn't halaj saying it. It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking, his will speaking through halaj. And nobody can deny this. It's in the hadith. Hadith Qudsi. And it's also in the Quran, but it's the hadith Qudsi. Where Halaj, what Allah is saying, I become the tongue with which they speak. And of course, the ulama of the time didn't understand this at all. And unfortunately, one of the pious men of Allah were martyred. Yeah. But this is the truth. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. We just have to. That, that's, the, that's the interesting part about Islam, I think, though, that we have. Um, uh, Sorry, uh, is that we have to uh, we, we we have a role to play, also, into. Uh, we're not surrendering for, and you know our ourselves, our ego, our, and um, you know just for ourselves, for ourselves, salvation. We are doing it because we have to do it, because they everybody this world needs us to do it. <laughs> Not just the human beings, the trees need us to do it, you know, and probably the rocks. I don't know how, but you know, that's our role. And it's funny, we're talking about Salah, but I just remember something. I don't know if I can tell you an anecdote uh, quickly about my past, okay? Before I was uh, uh, Muslim, uh, I kind of got into. A, I performed Salah before I was a Muslim, <laughs> in a way, but in a very strange way. Uh, I wanted to try uh, everything, you know, because I, I felt stuck at the time, like stuck uh, into my spiritual practice. And uh, I decided I wanted to try the shamanic path, which I don't really believe in, but I heard, I, I've heard so much good about the psychedelics that can be, you know, mind the uh, altering experience can change your life and help some people get out of depression and so i thought okay i was i've been scared my whole life of the psychedelics because you know my mind is very precious <laughs> to me i don't want to you know uh, jeopardize it but i thought maybe maybe i can try you know i i, I research it and i maybe uh, if i do it in the right setting and it, maybe it could be safe so i uh, I grew my own mushrooms because I couldn't trust anyone. So I learned how to do that. I grew it I, you know, I made, uh, uh, and I harvested it and uh, dried it out. And, and I did my, I did only one. <laughs> that was enough. I did all that. It took months to prepare because it takes time to grow, but I couldn't buy it online. You don't know what you're getting. So, and I tried it. Okay. In a re really uh, shamanistic setting, not, recreational you know just serious ready to 
face death and everything, you know, really ready to receive the, the teaching. And what happened is that I felt really, really like crap very quickly. I didn't take very much, just a few grams, but that was enough for me. And I felt so bad and so insignificant and miserable. And my, my, my pride was crushed, but I felt like I was being crushed by giant hands. Even I thought my head will, I was being squeezed very hard. And the solution was to put myself into the child's pose on the, on the floor and, and beg for mercy. And then what happened? I heard a voice in my head because I was, I am, I am like, I'm nothing. I'm just a dirt. I'm just, and I heard a voice that said, no, you're not nothing. You are supposed to be standing that, that in essence, that's what it said, that I was supposed to be standing upright between heaven and earth. That was my position as a human being. So I got up because it was an order, very strong order inside of me. So I got up straight. <laughs> and and then the and then uh, purification started. I started like uh, vomiting energy. I couldn't see anything, but it was coming out of me. I, like the you feel like you want to scream. Ah, you know something wants to come out of you, but I couldn't scream because my wife was asleep <laughs> and she had work the next day. So there was not an option to do the therapeutical, you know, primal scream. But I heard, again, a voice that said, as long as you breathe, you don't need to scream. You don't need to make a sound. As long as you can breathe. So I started breathing, and I did that move. I involved my, I involved my arms. It was important. I learned that if I do this with my arms, I can get rid more easily of that bad energy. And I was like expelling what felt like vomiting, literally expelling heavy energy and my cat could see it because my, my my cat was looking around and was very like uh, like following stuff that i couldn't see so okay i don't care if i sound woo woo i believe in everything and now so but at the time i didn't tell my friends about that the next day but now i can say it because i know that was what happening that was what, what was happening but I remember that thing recently because I realized, wow, that was Salah. That was the movement of Salah. I became nothing because as a reaction, because I was being crushed. The pressure was being, you know, really strongly, maybe to squeeze out that, you know, that stuff. But then I went into the, the, the sujud and then the, the command to stand up stand back up. So that's amazing. <laughs> I don't know what you think of that. I never, you know, told you that one. That's a really interesting story. Uh, quite powerful. And actually, I think there's a lot of wisdom in it. A lot of wisdom. Not only does it remind me of Salah, but also of Hadra, the motion you were just demonstrating. Hadra, what is sometimes done when people are, in a, you know, standing and sometimes in a circle, but doing dhikr, but standing. And you find often that this motion of literally the hands coming up, coming down, yes, it's exactly. quite a powerful cathartic experience. Very powerful. So it's funny that this was like I discovered or it was revealed to me or it was, you know, but I didn't know about, I've seen Muslim do that, you know, their prayers, but I didn't connect the dots. It wasn't conscious, you know, but yes, the Hadra, you're saying you're, Exactly. That's exactly what I was doing. But even better, I never got back to that feeling of really, you know, something almost physical coming out. This uh, exorcism, I guess, <laughs> self-exorcism, we can call it. Uh, I never felt it. Maybe because it was done once and I was okay. Maybe they didn't come back in. I don't know. <laughs> mm. But I was, and the next day I felt like I don't need, to do that ever again. But I felt like, you know, uh, something happened, something serious happened to me that night. If anybody's interested in the topic of um, psychedelics or anything like that, there's a really good book that I would recommend by, I believe it's Stephen Taylor, and the book is called Waking from Sleep. And it's a very good 
research book on awakening experiences, but he juxtaposes them through psychedelics and through drugs and through different different things, and then he contrasts that with uh, disciplined spiritual practice. And he basically ultimately concludes, right, he's doing this almost in a sense of kind of like a research type of a, a book, but he concludes that with disciplined practice, you get all of the benefits, but none of the side effects. And it's much more sustainable, and it's also much more longer lasting. It's much more real and permanent. So if anybody's interested in that topic, because sometimes I get into questions on YouTube too, people ask about these things sometimes. Uh, that's a good book, Waking from Sleep, Stephen Taylor. I would even say that, yeah, as you said, drugs, but even other methods, because I know of breathing exercises that can put you in state of altered states that might be very impressive, but don't do anything because you are, you are for example, forcing, you know, you're shutting down your, your thinking brain through hyperventilating, for example. That's very useful if you want to stop thinking quick, but you're not going to develop the capacity to control your mind and stop your thoughts. You know, you're not going to reinforce your your attention muscle, you're not also, um, yeah, also when you do those exercises, I'm telling you that because I saw in the question someone asked about Wim Hof, which I practiced in the past. It is very uh, effective, but you also lose consciousness a little bit. You lose the, it slows down your thoughts, but I don't think you become more awake. You become in a weird state, I don't, in my experience, I don't know. Uh, people can have different experiences, but to me, all these uh, pranayama techniques might be very useful, but you can become like addicted to them for the, the, the buzz, you know, the, the effect, and it may be become addicted, even become addicted to the peace that you're getting into, you know, like a, like a opiate, you know, something to, to numb yourself, like alcohol will do. Alcohol too will slow down my thinking process, you know. But it's, I wouldn't compare it to spiritual training, you know. <laughs> but I think that's a very important point you, you, you raised there, that you can get into different kinds of states, but you're not training yourself. You're not, you're not going to be able to reach those states anyway. We want those states to be permanent eventually. <laughs> also, you know, and independent of any external, you know, it means you want to this to become your your state of being yeah and i'll just point out again which i try to do often and consistently is that our path the path that i have learned and taken from my teachers and that have been advised is a very sober path it's not a path that is about chasing experiences or even states and those things become quite uh, significant distractions and pitfalls on the path. And what we should be seeking is Allah's presence, Allah's pleasure. That's it. Allah's presence. And this is, of course, my opinion, and this is the way of my teachers as I've learned and understood from them. What we should, as servants of Allah, as Muslims, be seeking as human beings more than anything is the peace and the is the presence and the pleasure of God. That's all that matters. And then all of these states are actually byproducts of that you get all of that when you when you reach to the source when you reach to the king you get the entire kingdom as well yes. it, it all comes with it right but if you're seeking riches and treasures and wealth and experiences and states and adventure and excitement you miss you you may never get to the king you end up chasing these other things yes. and so remember this uh beautiful line in in Star Wars, uh, Yoda was telling Luke, uh, adventure, excitement, a Jedi crave not these things. <laughs> and as a young kid, I thought, wow, I want adventure, I want excitement. But yeah. I've, learned, I've learned that there's something far deeper. And then those things are, of course, you can still have excitement, experiences, adventure, but it's secondary. It's a byproduct of something far deeper, far more stable, far more permanent, and far more real. Anyway, um, we're at time, so we're going to try to wrap it up. I think that the main thing, right, that I found 
significant here is this idea that meditative practice and training and discipline can significantly augment our prayer, our Islamic prayer, and also our spiritual path in general. It, it creates the capacity for presence. And presence is an openness and a connectedness with what is, with the ocean of life and energy that we are existing in. And it makes possible for us communion with all things, with all living things, and all things are living. Everything is alive. Everything is alive. Earlier you mentioned plants and trees and ro rocks as well. Even rocks are alive. Their, their level of consciousness is very low compared to an organism that's moving or even a plant or a tree, but it actually has consciousness. And the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, proved it when he said, listen. And he took a few rocks in his hand and he told the Sahaba, listen, his companions, and they could hear the rock praising Allah. They could even hear the dhikr of the rock. Everything is alive. Everything exists. Yes. Yes. Everything that's in existence can only exist through the power of Allah's oceans of life. A life is one of his attributes. Everything is alive. That's why as Muslims, we have to treat everything with respect and with humility. You know, my sheikh gave a talk, an uh, example one time when even he kicked a rock and his sheikh got very angry with him for kicking a rock because he was being disrespectful to that rock that Allah created. Yeah, subhanAllah. Anyway, John, uh, and, and that's adab, right? What this is about, what the spiritual path of Islam is about, is about cultivating such a refined and developed level of adab, of etiquette, of manners, of excellence in everything you do. So you're not going through life like a buffalo or an yeah. elephant, just unconscious and asleep, but you begin to develop this excellence in everything you do. That's part of the spiritual path. That's part of cultivating Ihsan because Allah is always with us and Allah's presence is everywhere. Uh, I'll pass it to you, John, if you want to have some closing thoughts. Yeah, well, the presence, you said, I think is the, the key word because you said, uh, we said that, that we talked a lot about the peace and the benefits and the feeling good, but that ultimately that's not even important. This is the side effect of the presence. The presence is more important to be with God. And with God, you can even suffer and it's going to be okay. <laughs> you see that the, even if the peace is not there, if you're with God, without the peace, it's okay. You're going to feel deeply that it's okay. It's okay. And this presence, uh, yeah. Yeah, you said, uh, you said something else. Uh, yeah. With God, you can suffer with God. You can be disappointed with God. You can be, but if you're with God, yeah, that, that's it. That's what you, I think, the, the most important thing I've learned. And, and the peace will come. Everything you need will come, uh, as you said, as a bonus. And you, yeah, it's important to remember that we're not meditating to, to reach peace or to, to get something. We, we want to be with the, the king, and he will decide where we go. You go to the kitchen, go to the wherever, clean the bathroom, or sit next to me. <laughs> That's his, his decision. But we just want to be there. And, uh, and it's easy. He never refuse. You know, he never mm -hmm. say no. If you, if you just stay present, he's already there. <laughs> you just have to learn to... Where you know how to be present? He's already there, waiting for you, like the you know the prodigal son's uh, parable, waiting to make a party <laughs> when you come back. Allah, Allah, Allahu Hai, Allahu Haq. Truth, it is the truth. You know, and He is the source of peace. He is as salam. So by being with Allah, you get you get peace. You get everything. Everything is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make us good and true and sincere servants whose vision does not swerve, who seek Allah's countenance and his presence and his pleasure with sincerity, with excellence, and with humility. Thank you, John, for joining me for another, uh, hopefully, inshallah, uh, illuminating conversation. And thank you to all those who tuned in. Um, if you guys have not yet done so, please uh, subscribe to the channel. Feel free to leave a comment. 
let us know what you thought about this conversation and also additional threads that you think might be interesting for us to explore. And we will look forward to seeing you in a next conversation to connect with you guys then. All right, shukran Abdus Samad, and thank you to all of you. Fi Allah, Allah be with you all. Peace and blessings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.